And then we have Richard Gage, um, and uh, he's been an architect for 25 years. I'm going to, to read this here, even though I know. He's been an architect for 25 years as a member of the American Institute of Architects. He's a professional willing to place his credibility and reputation on the line and who has endured substantial personal sacrifice. He's a tireless and tenacious advocate for questions that all too few are willing to ask and truths that fewer still are willing to face, truths that, we, <clears throat> that may shake the foundations of our worldview. His deep concern about the destruction of the three World Trade Center high-rises on 9-11 began after hearing the startling conclusions of a reluctant 9-11 researcher, David Ray Griffin. Dr. Griffin was interviewed that eye-opening day in May of 06 on KPFA's Guns and Butter radio program by Bonnie Faulkner in Berkeley. Um, this changed our speaker's life radically and launched his own unyielding quest for the truth about 9-11, inspiring him to found the organization Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. AE 9-11 Truth now numbers more than 1,900 architects and engineers and 17,000 others, all demanding a new investigation into these catastrophic structural failures. Our speaker has presented to groups of 100 to 3,000 people in 27 countries and 80 American cities to over 300 packed audiences of whose worldview has been irrevocably altered by this myth-shattering information. <clears throat> He's a personal source of inspiration to me. I will say I'm not only reading that, but that's very true. And I consider him to be a beacon of truth, a patriot, and a friend. Give him a warm welcome, Mr. Richard Gage. Thank you, George. Well, good evening, and it's awesome to be back in Portland once again. And I want to thank you for your willingness and your courage uh, regarding this very difficult subject of 9-11 and the destruction of the World Trade Center, of course, with its staggering loss of life. You know, just as architecture and engineering projects are sometimes quite joyful, sometimes extremely difficult, this particular project has proven to me to be one of the most difficult. Not difficult in terms of the conclusions that we reach, but the implications of those conclusions. And finding people open-minded and willing enough, like yourself, to come and to examine the facts. So our commitment to you tonight is to speak the truth and to leave you with extremely valuable information so that you'll have a clear idea of what is science and what is conspiracy. So please uh, check out every fact uh, tonight. Uh, we're not looking for believers. Do your own research. My magazine did, and they found that 36% of Americans want a new investigation. They say it's not a fringe phenomena. It's a mainstream political reality, this 9-11 truth movement. Another poll in 2007 determined uh, that 16% of Americans want a new investigation because they believe that, that the towers came down because of controlled demolition. Well, I want to find out where we are in the room before we begin looking at the evidence. So I'd like to ask you, how many of you pretty much um, believe the official story as it is? How many might be unsure and how many may already agree with the evidence for explosive controlled demolition. So first, the official story. We have jet planes hitting the towers, large explosion of jet fuel, and office contents burning, and a gravitational collapse due to the jet plane impacts and the resulting fires. Uh, that's pretty much the official story. How many of us are there? Haven't heard too much otherwise. Um, uh, raise your hand real high, I want to count you actually. You, you have to vote for one of these. I have at least one or two. Is there no more who, people who are, agree with the official story already? Just two? Three? Four? Thank you. How many are unsure? You might have heard a few things. 
Or go like this so I can actually count you real fast. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. And how many may already have already come um, agreeing with the evidence for controlled demolition? You're, oh, jeez. So uh, I'll count you guys later. Uh, we'll do some math here. Uh, why didn't you bring your friends? <laughs> Don't have any more friends, huh? <laughs> We're going to help you with that tonight. It's, we've got um, a lot of tools that you can use. Um, so next time we want to see the auditorium completely packed uh, because uh, as, you, as, you, as you will realize, we'll do this poll again at the end of the little talk that we have this afternoon and uh, you'll see, I think, uh, there'll, there'll be quite a shift e even as many, with as many as you, of you th that there are already. Uh, so NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, who was tasked by the Congress to examine these buildings and determine how they came down, said they found no evidence for explosive demolition, or explosions even. Uh, later they were asked, well, did you look? And they say, no, we didn't look. <laughs> It's really rather extraordinary. How can you find what you're not looking for or refuse to look for? Well, thousands of others did. Uh, we've been speaking about it uh, for seven years now. Architects and engineers, 2,000 architects and engineers almost now, uh, signing our petition calling for a real investigation. Um, these are not conspiracy, th conspiracy theorists. Uh, we're looking at the science-based forensic evidence found in the debris pile, the eyewitness testimony, and the video testimony, as you'll see. How many architects are there here tonight, by the way? Uh, one? Any more? Two? And uh, any engineers? Whoa! One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Great! Um, and how many normal people? <laughs> yes! Good! We're off to a good start then. Uh, I am not a normal person. I'm an architect and I have uh, been suffering ever since. But uh, like other architects, I have uh, worked on many steel frame buildings, including this, uh, uh, this $120,000, excuse me, $120 million high school in San Ramon, and this $400 million project in near Las Vegas uh, with uh, 1,200 square feet of 1,200 tons of steel framing, much of which is fireproofed in these mid-rise um, buildings. So that's just a little bit about me. We do have a website, and uh, if you, we're going to go very fast through the information tonight. By the way, how many of you did indeed not get a brochure when you came in? If you don't have a brochure in your hand, go like this. And uh, there's a whole lot of you, so I want you to ask you to keep your hands up. We have brochures for you. In there, there's an outline. You can follow us. But if you find that you, you're not getting it all, just realize that the website has lots of great information. So when they come back in with the brochures, uh, please don't be shy. You won't be bothering anybody. Let's look at 9-11 then and see what happened on that morning. We'll need sound. And we'll keep the sound up for the entire duration. Raise your hand if you need a brochure. I'm going to start the video over. On September 11th, we learned that four passenger planes were hijacked and taken radically off course. Within an hour, two of the planes had flown into the enormous steel towers of the World Trade Center, creating fires and eventually toppling them. Stage lights. Dazed by the news, the American public soon believed the fires in the towers had burned so hot they caused the steel frames of the buildings to give way. A myth developed, fed by official sources through the media to a bewildered audience. So what was the task again? Elements of the myth. 
The impact of the airplanes, gallons of burning jet fuel, steel melting, the buildings failing and suddenly imploding. In a mere 10 seconds, 110 stories hurtled earthward, pulverizing into dust. Right from the start, on the street itself, the official story was born. Come out of nowhere and just scream right into the side of the Twin Tower, exploding through the other side. And then I witnessed both towers collapse, one first and then the second, mostly due to structural failure because the fire was just too intense. The myth bled into the FEMA report and was echoed by the experts. It was the combination of the impact load doing great damage to the building, followed by the fire that caused collapse. Well, there's pretty much the official story in a nutshell, and what we're going to do this afternoon is test it against the scientific method, which we've been given for the last hundred years or so in the West to winnow error from truth. So what we do is we formulate a question. How did the towers come down? What caused that catastrophic collapse? We do background research. Um, we make some observations. We construct a hypothesis, our best guess as to what happened. We make some predictions and then test that hypothesis with experiments. And we analyze the results, draw conclusions, and if it is corroborated by the evidence, the experiments, we report it in an open, transparent manner. So we, we do that so other scientists can build on the body of that uh, verified uh, sets of, of data and evidence. Now, if the hypothesis is not corroborated, we go back, we construct a new hypothesis that stands a better chance against the experimental data. This is not difficult, and uh, we'll see how NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, performed with relative to the scientific method. So first, we gather data. Let's apply this method to the, uh, to the, to the towers. Uh, and many, uh, let's find out, for instance, what are the forces that have destroyed buildings historically? Okay, well, fire is certainly one of those forces. Um, fire is an organic process. It moves through a building every 20 minutes or so in a given area looking for fresh new fuel sources and it moves on. So when buildings come down due to fires, and you'll note that we haven't ever had a steel frame or concrete frame building come down due to fires, but a skyscraper that is. But uh, say in a wood frame building, you'd, you'd have la large m massive uh, movements of, or falling asymmetrically, organically. It doesn't just come straight down through the path of uh, greatest resistance, the, structural, the structure in there. So uh, it's a chaotic natural process. But again, I, in the history of high rises, we've never had any of them come down. Uh, for instance, uh, this 62-story uh, building burned three and a half hours over five floors. And in Philadelphia, 18 hours over eight floors. Venezuela, 17 hours over 26 floors. These buildings have been fully engulfed with much hotter, much larger fires than we're going to be seeing uh, in the towers uh, t this afternoon. Uh, these buildings uh, had something else happen to them, an earthquake, a natural force that caused them to collapse. Uh, the structural system is not completely dismembered one from another. The concrete is not pulverized to a fine powder like we see in the towers on 9-11. So keep this in mind. It's a very important set of evidence in our background research that we find that NIST uh, did not do. These buildings, for instance, uh, were exploded. Uh, we have thick, billowing, enormous clouds, pyroclastic clouds, like from a volcano, where the solids are suspended in the air and the heat produced, in this case, by the explosives uh, produces these um, cauliflower-shaped uh, formations with a very thick edge between the, uh, the, the, the outside, the, the solid-like object. Uh, so we have witnesses that hear sounds of explosions. They see flashes of light. If you have these features, you know you have explosions. That's important because 
explosions are not a part of the official story for the destruction of either of these towers. Now, explosions can be harnessed very effectively in controlled demolitions. Uh, we have hundreds of examples from all across the country to make our comparison of controlled demolitions to what happened at the Twin Towers, because this is the most commonly used method to bring down high-rises, and that's accomplished by placing thousands of explosives uh, next to the columns, the vertical structures in these buildings, and then detonating them in a precise order, synchronistically timed, which removes the thousands of tons of structure effectively, allowing the buildings to fall at virtually free fall acceleration into their own footprint. It's a very specific feat that only a handful of companies in the United States can even accomplish, and fire never has, of course. So it's not going to be too difficult to make our comparison because we have typical features with controlled demolitions. Beginning with, is, is there a sudden onset of destruction at the, base of the foot, uh, at the base of the structure? We have a straight down symmetrical collapse into its own footprint because demolition waves remove that column support. This results in a free fall speed virtually uh, through the path of what was the greatest resistance, the thousands of tons tons of structural steel in the way, holding the building up. We have a total dismemberment of that steel structure, so it's broken up, ready for loading and shipment. Minimal damage to adjacent structures and sounds of explosions uh, that are seen and heard, flashes of light that are seen, sounds of explosions that are heard by witnesses, and resulting also in enormous clouds of pulverized concrete and pyroclastic-like smoke clouds and what appear to be squibs or isolated explosive ejections occurring, off, occurring in various places in the building that are obviously explosives. And of course, evidence, chemical evidence of residue of explosives left behind. If you have all these, this is direct evidence of explosive destruction. Fire can't create any one of them, let alone all of them. So if you have these, in addition to government documentation sometimes, uh, experts agree, those without a, a bias, those without federal contracts that might be intimidated to speak up about such important uh, issues that threaten their contracts, uh, would agree. That's a controlled demolition. Foreknowledge, these are planned months in advance. So we have people that are aware uh, in, in these cases that uh, of, the, of the impending uh, destruction of these buildings. Uh, so if we have all of this, this is proof, of course, of controlled demolition. Now with that in mind, let's apply that set of criteria or proofs to World Trade Center 7 using the scientific method, observing what happened, applying what we know. Building 7, most people are unaware of. It's the third worst structural failure in modern history, and yet most architects and engineers know nothing about it. How many, well, let me test, like I did six years ago, how many of you are unfamiliar relatively with this building seven? Go like this, I'll count you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Thank you. I, I don't feel so bad now. <laughs> because uh, we didn't know about this third skyscraper that collapses at 5.20 in the afternoon. It wasn't hit by an airplane. And it's the tallest building in most of our states. Uh, and so here it is next to the Twin Towers, uh, about half the height of the towers. They are the tallest buildings in the world at the time. And so it's uh, just slightly taller than the Wells Fargo Center, uh, which is 41 stories here in Portland. But in the afternoon, uh, it's still standing uh, after the tower, well, here's in the morning, having been hit by some of the debris that was ejected from the north tower next to it, uh, it's still standing, had minor damage from that debris, and a few small fires were started. What we're going to do is watch its destruction, because it was filmed in front of God and everybody, we're going to take a look at it and see what we think and compare. Does it have any of the features of controlled demolition? Beginning with, is there a sudden onset of destruction at the base of the structure? Well, let's listen to Dan Rather narrate uh, his version of the events 
uh, that morning as he's watching. Let's leave the sound on for the videos through the duration. It's amazing. A, a amazing, incredible, pick your word. For the third time today, it's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed, destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. Uh, so here's Dan uh, using his intuition to describe what he's seeing. And we've all seen the old hotels in Las Vegas, for instance, and it actually kind of looks like that pretty much. Let's take another look. Is the building coming straight down symmetrically into its own footprint? Let's take a look from West Street. Start suddenly, pretty symmetrical. Um, this is pretty amazing, and we'll see the, the penthouse uh, drops first, indicating core column damage, which we'll get to uh, underneath the penthouse itself. And then the whole building comes down, of course, uniformly. I'm not quite convinced yet. Let's look at a known controlled demolition on the right, building seven on the left. Is there any similarity? Is there enough similarity to warrant an investigation into the possible use of explosives? especially since no fire has ever brought down a skyscraper, and all skyscrapers that have come down have been brought down by controlled demolition, and it looks exactly like one. And yet NIST never examined the possibility, seriously, of controlled demolition. Is that using the scientific method? No, they picked these fires, which are the worst fires that we have photographic or video evidence of, and named that as their source of the destruction of this building, and justified it with elaborate computer models, uh, which we will get to, even though their theory, which is thermal expansion during the fire, uh, caused a girder to be knocked off its seat on a column, which caused the internal failure and then the overall external failure, which has so many problems that we don't have time to get into today. But the fire itself was out an hour before on that floor uh, where they said that initiation of collapse began due to that thermal expansion. So it makes no sense, the 12th floor being the area where the fire was. And so this building comes down into its own footprint uh, uh, just about. And so how does that happen? How do you bring a building straight down? You have to remove the columns all at once, all 82 columns at once within a fraction of a second synchronistically timed. You saw in fact the penthouse fall just a half a second prior to the overall, indicate, overall building indicating that the core columns must have been taken out first. And that, and that also synchronistically timed floor by floor, of course. So how fast does this building come down? It comes down at free fall acceleration. This is really fast. It's as fast as this brick falls from my hand. Three, two, one. How does an object fall at free fall? Uh, it falls because there is no resistance supporting it. In that building, there was 40,000 tons of structural steel supporting it one second. The next second, it is all gone. Not one of those columns gave any resistance to this building. What happened to them? Did fire remove them? Does fire have the precision to remove all those columns at once? No. It's as if all eight stories, uh, because that's the period of free fall, uh, Two and, a, two and a quarter seconds, absolutely no resistance, gave way at once, allowing this building to come down. You see it gaining additional downward momentum with every second and fits the free fall curve exactly. Now NIST was forced into acknowledging this fact of free fall due to public embarrassment by members of our organization at their press conference. So they admit that it came down by free fall, but of course they do not acknowledge the implications which is that those columns had to have been removed, which can only be done 
uh, by explosives, uh, as far as we know. There's, fire certainly can't. Uh, resulting in the total dismemberment of this steel structure. This was a 47-story skyscraper with moment-resisting steel frame uh, structure, which is extremely strong welded connections, uh, most of them. And these must have been given separated one from the other in order to bring it down like a house of cards into a pile only about five stories high. Remember, buildings that fall due to natural causes, their structural system doesn't completely dismember like this. Do we have witnesses that heard sounds of explosions? Here's one, Kevin McPadden, former Air Force medic. And then it was like another two, three seconds, you heard explosions. Like, boom! It has like a distinct sound. It's not like when in compression, like boom, 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 boom. Like floors that were dropping and collapsing. This was ba boom! And like you felt a rumble in the ground, like almost like you wanted to grab onto something. That, to me, I knew that was ex an explosion. There was no doubt in my mind. And this gentleman. When we got to the eighth floor, I started walking to one side of the building. That side of the building was gone. The first explosion I heard when I was on the stairwell landing, when we made it down to the sixth floor. Then when we made it back to the eighth floor, I heard some more explosions. You know, also the sound? Like a boom, like, a, like an explosion. And more than one? Yes. We started walking down the stairs, we made it to the eighth floor. Big explosion, blew us back into the eighth floor. When we get outside, police officer comes to me and says, you have to run. We have more information of bombs, so you have to run. What? More information of bombs. All of these witnesses, and there are many more, of explosions in these buildings, uh, none of them are reported in the official NIST report. They, it's as if they have been removed. Uh, this particular explosion occurred in the afternoon. It's not in the report. Yeah, here's one of the guys. He can tell you I'm OK, all right? Here, hold on. You want, call your, you want to call your mother or something? Why would there be such massive explosions that are unreported? Well, all of this is direct evidence of explosive destruction. Fire can't account for any one of them, let alone all eight of them in this case. Fires like this in World Trade Center 5 next door, completely engulfed. If any of these World Trade Center buildings were going to come down due to fire, you'd expect it to be this one, did it? No. Fireproofed steel frame buildings do not come down due to fires, especially these fires, the worst fires we have photographic or video evidence of. And straight down and completely destroyed by those fires. Now, the evidence, the steel which is used to figure out how these buildings failed historically was shipped away at 400 truckloads a day. There's a, the destruction of evidence in a crime scene is illegal, but this was declared an act of war, so that it wasn't, it wasn't um, a criminal investigation. But obviously it needs to be. What do the experts say? Here's the top European controlled demolition expert, Danny Jowenko, 27 years in the business says it starts from below. They've simply blown away the columns. Now he's looking at a video of the building coming down shortly after 9-11, but not knowing that it was, that this building came down on 9-11. So he's, it's really a blind study. He says it's controlled demolition. Team of experts did this. Professional work, without a doubt. Then he was told, well, this happened on 9-11. And he said, well, they must have worked very fast. <laughs> well, it takes months to plan a, a controlled demolition. This structural engineer, one of 60 on our petition calling for a real investigation, says a localized failure in a steel frame building like World Trade Center 7 cannot cause a catastrophic collapse like a house of cards without a simultaneous patterned loss of several of its columns at key locations within the building. Well. What about foreknowledge? Listen to these mysterious construction workers walking away from Building 7, hearing an explosion over their shoulder, looking back at the building, and then looking straight into the CNN camera and saying this. Oh, Lord. You hear that? 
Keep your eye on that building. It'll be coming down. Building is about to blow up. Move it back. All right, guys. We are walking back. There's a building about to blow up. On flame. Debris coming down. How do they know that the fires in that building are about to bring it down? Especially those fires, which the firemen were told not to fight, by the way. Um, they, t they were told there's structural damage in that building, which turns out not to have been a significant cause at all in the destruction of this building, according to the official story. Pretty interesting. And this gentleman, uh, Kevin McPadden, what did he hear on the radio held in the hand of a Red Cross worker at the location where they were all pulled back six blocks uh, behind the yellow tagged line? At the last few seconds, he took his hand off, and you heard three, two, one. Do fires bring buildings down to countdown? Well, better than that is the forecasting of this building's destruction by the BBC 20 minutes before it came down. They apologize for this grievous error, citing the confusing events of the day. Does this make them psychic? What's going on here? Uh, is the, and it, so far, for Building 7, is the hypothesis of controlled demolition uh, supported here? I asked you before about the Twin Towers. Um, how many of you, um, uh, at this point, uh, believed relative to Building 7 that it came down according to the official story, which is normal office fires? But if, please, uh, don't let me intimidate you. I know this is difficult, but if you do, please raise your hand. How many of you might be unsure? You're still, just very reasonably to be unsure. One, two, three. Okay, three. How many of you think this building came down by controlled demolition? Okay, we have a little problem here, don't we? Who was in this building? Uh, the CIA, the IRS, the Department of Defense, Giuliani's Office of Ma Emergency Management. This is a very secure building, one of the most secure, along with the Twin Towers, outside the Pentagon. Is it reasonable to assume that Al-Qaeda could have gotten access to this building to plant these explosives? You begin to see some of the problems we have as rational people looking at scientific forensic evidence, trying to come up with a conclusion that doesn't match our worldview. Who would have done such a thing? Why would they mislead us about the cause of this building's collapse? Uh, Ken is going to help us in the afternoon about answering some of those questions. In the meantime, what has happened so far with the architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth is that we have assembled a massive group of activists, hopefully including yourself, to support the ad campaign Rethink 9-11. And you can support that at Rethink911.org, where we have 11 cities around the world that we're focusing ads on, billboards, bus shelters, taxi tops, and a whole level of grassroots active, active uh, activities that are designed to raise awareness during the month of September. So we've got a lot of time to plan this. We've already raised over $150,000 but we need about $250,000, so please help us with the campaign. We think Building 7 is the key to getting justice for those lives lost in the Twin Towers, uh, because it is so obvious to just about all of you and me once I became aware of it, right? This is, the media has not shown us the third worst structural failure in modern history. It's amazing, we went to Denver to the convention where 14,000 architects were two weeks ago, we had a booth and we would tell people, we, we handed them a flyer that, did you know, uh, third time, no. You know, 90% of them don't even know. Once they know, they're actually quite interested, of course, as I hope you are. So I hope you're interested enough to want to sign up for our free monthly email newsletter which we send out giving you the latest evidence. So I'll pass these clipboards out and ask um, somebody to help me to make sure that they get to you guys that snuck through the ropes in the back and to the, the far side over here. Uh, because we'll give you the latest evidence, the latest progress that we're making in our efforts to 
uh, awaken the American people and to get a real investigation. And we have created a documentary that became the most watched and most shared video on PBS.org, the national website. And I want you to see four minutes of this because altogether there's 43 experts in this film uh, testifying. Uh, they're high-rise architects, structural engineers, metallurgists, chemists, physicists, uh, and it is really good. I know because I made it. Watch. of them they can go on we can speculate on that forever what we really need to know is how how those buildings came down world trade center 7 collapsed because of fires fueled by office furnishings it did not collapse from explosives or from fuel oil fires to undermine scientific integrity is to undermine our democracy this is what NIST has done, denied and ignored crucial evidence. The American people absolutely need the truth of 9-11. More than 1,500 architects and engineers and 12,000 others, including many scientists, have signed a petition calling for a scientific investigation of the destruction of the Twin Towers and World Trade Center Building 7. The report issued by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, referred to as NIST, was not valid science. They're talking about a single columnar collapse or failure that resulted in a total collapse of the building. Building number seven uh, descended in free fall for the first 100 feet, which uh, means that there was absolutely no resistance to the descent whatsoever. So all of the columns really needed to be severed at the same time. The symmetry is the smoking gun. NIST has admitted it went into free fall for eight stories. You don't need to be an engineer or an architect to see what happened to those buildings. This is controlled demolition. Zeker weten. Zeker weten. What I saw, it was a classic implosion. The center of the core, the penthouse area, starts to move first, and then the building follows along with it. NIST excluded the document from FEMA in Appendix C that documented the evidence of melting steel. In an office fire, you cannot generate enough heat to melt steel. There were these iron microspheres present in all of the dust samples. They needed to have been formed in extremely high temperatures. All the characteristics of the microspheres, along with what I see in the attack of the, uh, the beams that were actually found, tell me that thermite was involved. In the dust, what we have found is a modern version of thermite, which we call nanothermite. NIST concedes that they found no evidence for explosives. So then we asked them, well, did you look? And they said, no, we did not look for explosives <laughs> or residues of explosives. And in fact, the evidence is overwhelming that these red-grade crystals are very high temperature incendiaries. And we have watched as scientific integrity has been undermined and scientific research politicized in an effort to advance predetermined ideological agendas. If this is a crime, I think everybody agrees it's a crime. Evidence was removed from the scene of the crime. You can't do science when you are deprived of the evidence and when your hypothesis is the least valid instead of the most likely. When the most likely hypothesis in, in the case of Building 7 wasn't even mentioned. Uh, this is not science. We have this DVD available for you uh, after the presentation in the back also, so I hope you uh, make use of it because it is full of very valuable information which when you get to the World Trade Center towers uh, becomes even more obvious interestingly enough uh, we'll take a look at it the structure is extraordinary 47 columns uh, tight, tightly pulled into the core 
uh, and with an exoskeleton of steel wrapped around the, out, the perimeter, almost solid steel at the bottom. And we have an extraordinary uh, structure that uh, has spanning between the heavy core structure and the perimeter, these lightweight steel trusses that um, are blamed for uh, uh, their, uh, their vulnerability uh, to fires. We'll take a look at the official story in a moment. But what we're going to do is compare, again, the features of a classic controlled demolition and see how it compares and contrasts with the Twin Towers in this case. Uh, because we have a sudden onset of destruction, but not at the base of the structure, but up at the jet plane impacts. Remember, these are deceptive controlled demolitions. The intent is to have us see uh, that this is coming down due to the, the resulting airplane impacts and fires. It's like a magic show in Las Vegas where something's happening out front where you're supposed to be watching, but something's happening behind uh, or to the side that you're not supposed to see. That's what we're going to be taking a look at this afternoon. Because are there sounds and flashes, once again, that are producing those explosions, heard and seen by witnesses? Well, it turns out that in August of 2005, over 110 first responders are on record talking about such sounds of explosions and seeing flashes of light. It is reported uh, by the New York Times because the city would not release this information for four years until they were sued and then this case got overturned. 12,000 pages of testimony uh, released in August of 2005, but the media didn't pick it up except for the New York Times, which published it. And we find all of these firefighters talking about explosions. Uh, it actually shook my bones shortly before the first tower came down. I remember feeling the ground shaking. Well, the ground is shaking uh, thousands of feet below the, 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 the explosions that are occurring up above it. It must have been more than just a simple collapse mechanism starting up there. Somewhere around the middle of the World Trade Center, there was this orange and red flash coming out. Just kept popping all the way around the building and that building had started to explode. One floor after another. I figured it was a bomb, a synchronized, a deliberate kind of thing. It seemed like on television when they blow up all these buildings, like it was going all the way around like a belt, all these explosions. Well, let's take a look and see what they might be referring to. Here's a known controlled demolition on the left and on the right, uh, the World Trade Center 1, the North Tower. A sudden onset of destruction, relatively symmetrical, and we'll see how fast it's nearly free fall acceleration. In fact, it looks very similar to World Trade Center 7 in the first four seconds. Something else happens after that. We'll take a look. That's when I saw the building coming down. Pop, pop, pop. Heard that friggin' noise. Number of brief light sources being emitted from inside the building between floors 10 and 15. I saw low level flashes. With each popping sound, it was initially an orange and then a red flash that came out of the building. And then it would just go all the way around the building on both sides. Let's take a look at the South Tower, World Trade Center 2 on the right, a known controlled demolition on the left. Is there any similarity? Is there enough similarity to warrant an investigation into the possible use of explosives? Especially since it looks exactly like one in this case. I saw flash, 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 then it looked like the building coming down. I thought the terrorists planted explosive somewhere in the building. That's how loud it was, a crackling explosive. Another loud boom at the upper floors and then a series of smaller explosions which appeared to go completely around the building at the upper floors. Well, let's take a physics lesson here and try to understand what's happening. Uh, just simply, if we run a Volkswagen into a Mack truck, who wins? The, the heavier, stronger object, right? This is a lesson in Newton's third law. Does it matter if we drop the Volkswagen onto the Mack truck? No. The lighter structure cannot possibly destroy the heavier, stronger structure. It's against the laws of physics. 
Well, let's take a look, because we're going to see that's exactly what happens. In fact, the Volkswagen up here is being destroyed in the first four seconds. After that, there's nothing left to destroy the rest of the building. Watch. There's no movement from here downward until... It's being destroyed, just like Building 7 in, this, in, this, in the first two seconds. And then in the first four seconds, it's completely gone. Uh, we have... Um, let's start it, and we will stop it. Just like the fireman described, like a belt. All these explosions symmetrically all around the building. Go. Stop. Stop. And more, more explosions. Go. Let's take a look at what's happening here. We're told that this 12-story section, in the case of the North Tower, is driving the rest of the building down. How many of you see a 12-story section of building in the North Tower or a 30-story section of the building in the South Tower driving anything down? As you saw, it was being destroyed. Every member, in fact, shattered. There's nothing left uh, other than a loose pile of dismembered structural components um, that are being laterally discharged that will look. It's, it looks more like a volcanic eruption, in this case in the Tongan Sea in 2009, with upward, outward arching streamers. Um, we have uh, thick pyroclastic-like clouds trailing uh, pulverized building materials and structural steel elements ejecting laterally. Gravity works down, not out. Something else is happening here. And let's take a look at what's happening underneath this zone of destruction. We have a very violent series of explosions occurring. Uh, and watch down in the corner, racing down the corner, as fast as the debris falling uh, to the side of it. A series of uh, explosive activity uh, going on there. And so let's find out uh, what happens to this material because we have a 207 foot wide building but the debris uh, extends well beyond 1200 feet, 1400 feet in every direction symmetrically, uh, well beyond the boundaries of ground zero. Uh, there are body parts from people found hundreds and hundreds of yards away as small as, uh, as, as a half an inch. Um, and, and, and there's much more information about that that I can't get into tonight, uh, but uh, 700 bone fragments, for instance, found on top of a skyscraper across the street. This is an extraordinary degree of pulverization and distribution here. Uh, what about these isolated explosive ejections uh, that we see? Well, we're told by NIST that uh, these must be there are puffs of air being produced by that uh, giant uh, pile driver, the 12-story pile driver pushing the building down, but these are not puffs of air. They're pulverized building materials. They're being shot out at 160 to 200 feet per second. These are propelled by explosives at those speeds. And um, they occur at the midpoints, often, of the facade. Uh, so they're, 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 they're not that random. Um, and let's say in, in the open office planning that was achieved by the structural design in the World Trade Center towers where they grouped the core columns around the elevator shafts and have this, as a result, 60 feet of open office planning. That was the unique structural innovation in the planning of these buildings. Um, that air being coming down, say, behind me is the elevator shafts. That air is going to whoosh out into these open office and, and blow out all the windows, or none of them, but not these highly focalized, geometrically precise uh, points of ejection here that, that we see. Now, how fast is the building coming down? Uh, here's, let's look at it. Here's three seconds, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, uh, each building is completely shattered. Its structural system is shattered uh, in about a dozen seconds. This is almost free fall 
acceleration, free fall acceleration would be about 10 seconds. Now that is the structure that's, that's designed to resist by a factor of three to, three to five times the, it, what it is needed to hold this building up. That's the safety factor. And yet it's coming down again as if it's not even there. What happened to that structure? Well, it's been completely dismembered, as you can see in all of these photos, particularly the high-res uh, satellite photos of the debris down at the bottom. These are the, the perimeter of these two towers, and yet the debris is equally distributed uh, about them, and the structure is completely broken up almost and ready for shipment. Let's take a look at the structural dismemberment of the South Tower. Uh, it's hit by the plane about 30 stories down. It begins to fall over. We would expect it to continue its angular momentum and fall off the building in some mangled heap found at the bottom, but that's not what happens. In fact, it's 22 degrees off center. How can it destroy the building beneath it symmetrically uh, when it's falling off the building? You can't have it both ways. And yet, watch what's happening below. Complete structural, uh, uh, complete sy symmetrical destruction all the way down the face of the building, traveling at virtually free fall acceleration. And in fact, sometimes it's faster than free fall acceleration physicists have found. That, that makes no sense. Here's a close up. What are we looking at? Are we looking at a gravitational collapse? Uh, or are we looking at a series of explosions? Well, every member from another, save these shards of remaining structural perimeter sections, is uh, completely shattered uh, away from e uh, each other, which is one of the classic uh, signs of uh, explosive destruction according to the National uh, Fire and Protection Association in its Guide for Explosion Investigations, NFPA 921, uh, says definitely look for uh, that among other uh, indications and evidence of explosive destruction, including lateral ejection of steel, where we see freely flying structural steel objects ranging from four tons to 10 tons uh, being uh, ejected laterally. Watch this one. Is that a gravitational collapse or the result of one? It takes an extraordinary amount of energy, uh, enough to hurl a 200-pound cannonball three miles to get these individual sections uh, out. And how about uh, the floors? We're looking for 110 floors at the bottom of this pile, uh, like this classic uh, pancaking collapse, which there are a couple of examples of such, but we don't see those floors. 110 floors, each an acre in size, missing at the bottom of each of the Twin Towers. 220 acres of metal decking, thick fluted galvanized steel decking sheets, an acre in size, missing from at the bottom. Where, where are they? Well, I've looked uh, with a magnet and, in these dust samples and you find small metal filings in them. What are they doing there and, uh, uh, and, and how did that happen? Uh, it doesn't happen by a gravitational collapse. We would expect to find 110 floors with people mangled in, 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 in there. Uh, but uh, there's 20,000 pieces of bodies found and, and yet 1,000 people are completely missing not a trace. Something else is going on here besides a gravitational collapse, which is causing the pulverization of 90,000 tons of concrete in midair. It doesn't happen at the bottom as a result of the kinetic energy that's developed. It's pulverized in midair into fine particles, mostly dust, which blanketed lower Manhattan from river to river with these fine 100 micron particles of dust, most of them laying about 4 to 12 inches thick. In that dust, the concrete comprises about 30 percent of the dust. And, 
Also found in this dust is small iron microspheres. Now, we're told again by NFPA 921, the guide, the authority for fire and explosion investigation, watch for thermal effects that could come from incendiaries. Explosions go boom and provide gaseous expansion, propelling objects. Incendiaries work by massive heat. And in this case, we have uh, that heat found, documented by officials at the base of the structures, 2,800 degree temperatures documented by Bechtel. This is not normal. Office fires and jet fuel can't get this hot. And yet Peter Tully, the president of the construction cleanup company, says he saw pools of literally molten uh, steel is what they call it. Turns out to be molten iron. Dripping from the molten steel, this firefighter says, seeing the molten steel. Uh, molten metal pouring out of the tower minutes, the South Tower minutes before its collapse. We're told, oh, that's aluminum, melted aluminum from the jet plane. But melted aluminum is silvery in daylight conditions. It doesn't glow bright yellow, bright orange. And uh, steel members uh, appear to have been partially evaporated. This requires 4,500 degree temperatures to evaporate steel, and yet this fire protection engineer who's supporting the official story says the ends of the beams were partially evaporated. You can see that here where steel is turned to Swiss cheese. Normal office fires, jet fuel cannot do this. I'll show you in a moment. And yet this uh, heat is producing a solid steel girder um, turning it into Swiss cheese, like you see here. Plenty of examples of this. And melted concrete, 3,000 degrees. I didn't even know concrete could melt. 3,000 degree temperatures. And yet here is the response from the co-project leader at NIST for this investigation. First of all, let's go back to your basic uh, premise that there was uh, a pool of melted, melted steel. Um, I know of absolutely nobody, and no eyewitness who said so, nobody who's produced it. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel, yeah, molten bit. steel running down the channel rails, like you're in a foundry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like lava. Like, like, like lava. lava. Actually melted beams where it was molten steel that was being dug out. Underground, it was still so hot that molten metal dripped on the sides of a wall. And the cleanup was very difficult in the beginning. Steel was coming out red in certain areas from the first couple of weeks. This fused element of, of steel, mo molten steel. And they pulled out the big block of concrete, and there was a, like a little river of steel uh, flowing. A little river of steel. That was the designer of the structural uh, of the twin towers structural system back in the 60s. Well, here's John Gross, the same gentleman who denied that, actually uh, uh, finding and documenting the partially evaporated end of the steel beam from World Trade Center 7. His shadow is all over uh, the evidence. This is the piece that FEMA used that turned to Swiss cheese. Uh, and most of this uh, got shipped away within weeks for after World Trade Center 7 um, in World Trade Center 7's debris pile because theoretically nobody was, was, was killed in, in the, the collapse of that building. It was evacuated prior to the destruction of the Twin Towers. Well, these fires can get to be maybe 500 uh, or 1,200 degrees maximum under ideal conditions what can produce temperatures capable of melting steel or iron? 2,700 degrees it takes. Well, thermite is one possibility, uh, but uh, let's take a look and see, is there any evidence uh, of such thermite? And what is thermite anyway? An incendiary used by the military, thermite is a compound of iron oxide and aluminum, which when ignited sustains an extreme heat reaction creating molten iron. In just two seconds, thermite can reach temperatures over 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit, quite enough to liquefy steel. We know that open air fires cannot burn hot enough to melt steel, but metal had melted at the base of the towers. 
Appendix C of the FEMA report describes sulfur residues on the World Trade Center steel. The New York Times called this the deepest mystery of all. Sulfur slightly lowers the melting point of iron, and iron oxide and iron sulfide had formed on the surface of the structural steel. Sulfur used with thermite is called thermate, producing even faster results. Well, through the use of the scientific method in doing our background research as, as to the possibilities of the forces that could cause the evidence that we've seen, we might be getting somewhere. Because we're doing the work that our government was paid $20 million and took three years to accomplish. Um, so uh, what, what about um, what was found in the World Trade Center dust that might lead us to that possible conclusion of thermite? Well, uh, in all the dust samples, the USGS, uh, US Geological Survey, finds small iron microspheres. Uh, these are fascinating. They're the diameter of a human hair. They're iron, elemental iron. This is not melted steel. Uh, the, 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 and it has uh, some interesting chemical ingredients. Now, if there were thousands of cutter charges or, or devices that use thermite to destroy steel structures, and they were set off in an explosive condition in the World Trade Center towers, uh, under explosive conditions, the result as you saw, of the thermite ignition is molten iron, liquid molten iron. What happens to a liquid when it is atomized, which would, an explosion would clearly do? Uh, well, let's see what happens in this spray bottle. We have tens of thousands of liquid droplets. What's the shape? They're spherical. Why? Because when liquid is atomized, the surface tension forms itself into a sphere. And in the case of these spheres, liquid molten iron, it would cool and fall with all of the dust. This is the only rational uh, reason that the USGS and others also found up to 10 tons of this material in all the dust based on the weight, which is 6% of any given sample, or varying from 2 to 6% uh, of, of that dust, is these spheres. In fact, um, uh, yeah, up to 6%. Six, up to 6 so uh, it's so common that it's called a signature component. And would that, for instance, explain the toasting, if you will, of the tops of these cars uh, parked around the World Trade Center. Uh, what else could explain that from a gravitational collapse? Uh, here's a, a controlled demolition experiment that, as you can see, releasing thousands of uh, very hot molten iron droplets that you see, just from this small amount right here. Uh, and the chemical composition of that experiment, uh, including uh, aluminum, iron, oxygen, silica, sulfur, uh, matches almost identically those, the, the chemical signature of those spheres found at the World Trade Center. So we have the evidence of residue of thermite in all the World Trade Center dust completely unexplained in these reports by the USGS and R.J. Lee, uh, a, a large national consult environmental consulting firm. There are devices that are designed to have thermite in them and upon detonation ejecting liquid molten iron in milliseconds through the structural steel uh, adjacent. Now, these patents were developed prior to 2001. But is there any evidence of unignited thermite in the World Trade Center dust? Well, a small team of scientists led by Niels Harrod in Copenhagen analyzes four separately collected samples, including from this apartment by Jeanette McKinley. She had saved it for her art project. And in each of these samples, they find identical small red-gray chips. They're about a sixteenth of an inch long in some cases, red on one side, 
gray on the other. They come up to a magnet, so they're very curious. They have iron in them. Uh, this red side is zoomed in, well, it's composed of what? Uh, carbon, oxygen, aluminum, silica, iron. Iron and aluminum, aluminum the key ingredients of thermite. Iron, uh, iron oxide is basically rust. So it's rust and aluminum powder. What are the key ingredients of thermite, unignited thermite, doing in all the World Trade Center dust samples tested by this team? Well, they zoom in 50,000 times into the red side and they discover some very fascinating information. Uh, data, small uh, rhomboidal particles of iron oxide uh, about uh, 40 nanometers across, they are um, a, a thousand times smaller than the diameter of a human hair. The aluminum particles are, that are wafer-like are not much larger. These are built from the atomic scale up. This is nanotechnology, extremely sophisticated not made by falling particles of aluminum and rust mixing together somehow because they're in the perfect combination here, three quarters iron oxide, one quarter um, uh, aluminum, set in an organic bed of oxygen, silica, and carbon, which is designed to provide gaseous expansion or otherwise the cap explosive capability of this very high-tech material, which is um, when put in a heater, ignites and produces temperatures exceeding uh, the melting point of iron and releasing iron droplets everywhere in the heater that has heated them up. You see, the problem is that these spheres that are emitted have, again, the same exact signature of those spheres that are found in all the World Trade Center dust. So we know exactly what produced all those spheres found in the World Trade Center dust. It is these red-gray chips, as if we didn't know because those spheres are found attached to these partially ignited red-gray chips uh, already. Now, this material has been developed uh, again prior to 2001. Uh, in the most sophisticated laboratories of Lawrence Livermore, Los Alamos, and very high-tech uh, defense contractors. Um, so we have, uh, we have some investigation targets that can be approached because uh, this material is not made in a cave in Afghanistan. <laughs> it is documented in a peer-reviewed paper in the Bentham Open Chemical Physics Journal. It, has, it is uncontested in the last two or three years. It uh, has never been contested. The way to contest somebody's outrageous conspiracy theory is to come up with a peer-reviewed paper of your own contesting these results. This is often done and it has not been challenged, uh, at least in the peer-reviewed literature. People will say, oh, that's paint, or it's something else. This is very sophisticated material. I assure you it is not paint, and no one who looks at this uh, says that it is, uh, except for those who have a very high stake in the outcome of this very important argument in American society today. The question for you tonight is, is the hypothesis corroborated uh, for you? Does the evidence amount to direct evidence of explosive destruction, fire not being capable of uh, causing any of these, let alone all 10 of these key characteristic features uh, with additional corroborating evidence. Is this to you proof of controlled demolition? So I've made my case, but it doesn't matter what I think. I really want to know what you think. How many of us um, uh, uh, believe at this point that the towers were brought down according to the official story with jet plane impacts and, and office fires? And again, please be brave. Uh, one, thank you. And how many are unsure at this point? There were about 20 of you before. Surely there must be some. One, two, three, four, five. Did I hear one? Just five? Um, so we've, how many of you think these towers came down by controlled demolition? OK, yikes. Who has the problem here? The biggest problem. Yeah, it's you guys <laughs> who, uh, have acknowledged uh, the evidence for the explosive demolition 
of this building. We have a very serious problem because if this was not jet plane impacts or fires, then uh, it was something else, controlled demolition. What caused that? Who may have been responsible? Fortunately, we have an expert in the arguments uh, associated with those questions with us today, uh, Mr. Ken Jenkins. I'm going to bring him up in a moment. Uh, first, I want to uh, conclude and encourage you to do further research. Uh, that video is available for you uh, tonight, uh, $20 in the uh, hard case, uh, which includes two DVDs, or the main DVD in the enveloped version, which you can also uh, purchase, but it's only $10. Uh, well, uh, let's figure out what happened, because we've seen that explosives, most of us, were used uh, in uh, the destruction of these skyscrapers. Of course, it takes months of planning to engineer and place these explosives. Who had the means, the opportunity, the motive to engage in this crime? Who benefited? These are the classic questions that journalists and criminal investigators should be asking, but in the mainstream media are not. Who had access to these highly secure buildings? Who had access to these extremely sophisticated explosives? The architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth don't speculate about these issues. We don't have conspiracy theories for you. Um, uh, so this is just the beginning of a, admittedly, a disturbing but essential opportunity for you to uncover the rest of the mystery. And it is not an easy journey. Uh, in fact, I'll just play this uh, short clip from the psychologists who also appear in our DVD that I just showed you, trying to help us cope with uh, the difficult implications of the controlled demolitions of the Twin Towers. Most of us who have lived with the events of 9-11 have, as a result, experienced some kind of trauma. It can be very difficult to come to terms with what actually happened at the World Trade Center. In fact, someone told me recently, I wouldn't believe what you're telling me, even if it were true. So, uh, Our petition signers, with psychological expertise, sure, so have stepped yes. forward to offer so their insight. Kind of While this segment is clearly outside the knowledge base of the architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, these experts in psychology highlight their valuable experience for us as to why this evidence can still be so difficult for people to accept. At this point, we have nine years of hard scientific evidence that disproves a government theory about what happened on September 11th, and yet people continue to be either oblivious to the fact that this information exists or completely resistant to looking at this information. So the question becomes why? Why is it that people have so much trouble hearing this information? From my work, I think we would be remiss not to look at the impact of trauma. My name is Marty Hopper, and I'm a PhD clinical psychologist. I've been working and living for the past 30 years here in Boulder, Colorado. For the past 11 years, my work has focused on helping people who have experienced personal trauma. Now, as we know, the horrors of what happened on 9-11 were televised all over the world, and they were televised, in fact, live. We witnessed the deaths of almost 3,000 of our fellow Americans. We know this had a very um, severe and traumatic impact on a large a majority of the population. I myself cried for weeks after September 11th. A friend of mine who is a psychologist uh, in, in practice here in Boulder said that her caseload increased tremendously after 9-11 and people that she hadn't seen in 10 years were coming back into her practice. So I think it's safe to say that collectively as a nation, because of what happened on September 11th, we experienced trauma. I'm Fran Schur and I have a master's degree from the University of Colorado. I've had a private practice as a psychotherapist and as a licensed professional counselor for about 20 years. Why do people resist this information, the information that shows that the official story about 9-11 cannot be true? 
what I've learned is that as humans, each of us have a worldview. And that worldview is usually formed in great part by the culture we grow up in. When we hear information that contradicts our worldview, social psychologists call the, result, the resulting insecurity cognitive dissonance. For example, with 9-11, we have one cognition, which is what, our officials, what the official story of 9-11, what our government told us, what our media, media repeated to us over and over, that 19 Muslims attacked us. On the other hand, we have what scientists, researchers, architects, engineers are now beginning to tell us, which is that there is evidence that shows that the official story cannot be true. So now we've lost our sense of security. We are starting to feel vulnerable. Now we're confused. 9-11 truth challenges some of our most fundamental beliefs about our government and about our country. When your beliefs are challenged or when two beliefs are inconsistent, cognitive dissonance is created. 9-11 truth challenges the beliefs that our country protects us and keeps us safe and, and that America is the good guy. My name is Bob Hopper and I have a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Cincinnati. For the past 29 years, I've been a licensed PhD clinical psychologist in Boulder, Colorado. When your beliefs are challenged, fear and anxiety are created. In response to that, our psychological defenses kick in and they protect us from, our, from these emotions. Denial, which is probably the most primitive psychological defense, is the one most likely to kick in uh, when our beliefs are challenged. I'm Danielle Dupre, PhD, originally from Switzerland, where I studied psychology and psychoanalysis. For the past 15 years, I've been empowering people who have experienced significant trauma. America is a powerful nation. It has never been attacked. We were confident, we, were, we felt secure, and all of a sudden that security collapsed. People started to be fearful. With all those rumors, those news, people didn't know what to think about. And it's a very, very uncomfortable state to be in. And eventually, our mind shuts off. Just like when a computer is overloaded, our minds get overloaded. We can't handle it anymore and we shut down. It's easier to deny it and move on with our lives. What some of us will tend to do is deny the evidence that's coming our way and stick to the original story, the official story, and to try to regain our equ equilibrium in that way. Another thing we can do is decide to look at the conflicting evidence and be sincere and be open-minded and look at both sides of the issue and then make up our own mind about what reality is. I'm Dorothy Lorig. I have a master's degree in counseling psychology from the University of Colorado and I've been practicing reevaluation counseling for over 16 years. If we can think of our worldview as being sort of our mental and emotional home, I think all of us will do just about anything to defend our homes, to defend our families. And, and so I see that with people, and I saw that with myself when my brother tried to talk with me about it, of don't mess with me, don't mess with my home, don't mess with my comfort with how things, how things are. Um, and about a week later, I read a lengthy article by Professor Griffin um, about why he believes the official account of 9-11 cannot be true. And it was a very well-researched article. I was in my office at the time. I sat there and I felt my stomach churning. I thought maybe I was going to be sick. And I leaped out of my chair and ran out the door and took a, a long walk around the block, around several blocks, um, and just broke down. I understand now that what was happening was my worldview about my government being in some way my protector, almost like a parent had been dashed and uh, it was like being cast out into the wilderness I think is the closest way to describe that feeling and I sobbed and I sobbed felt like the ground had completely disappeared beneath my feet and and I knew at some point during the walk that I knew that I was going to have to become active in educating other people about this that there was that for me to retain any sense of integrity 
I was going to have to take some action. I couldn't just let something like this go. Many people respond to these truths in a very deep way. Some have a visceral reaction like they've been punched in the stomach. To begin to accept the possibility that the government was involved is like opening Pandora's box. If you open the lid and peek in a little bit, it's, it, it's going to challenge some of your fundamental beliefs of, about the world. Well, here are a few of those, ob those spontaneous initial reactions to hearing the contradictory evidence about 9-11. I don't want to know the truth or I'd become too negative and psychologically go downhill. I'm not sure I want to know. If this is true, then up would be down. Up would be down and down would be up. Uh, so we have a, a great need to do some follow-up, to do some research, to take some action, some of us are called to. Uh, we do need to follow our conscience and act. After all, um, consider the testimony of Zbigniew Brzezinski, former uh, national security advisor for the Carter administration, He's, who was alerting Congress to a future false flag attack against Americans by Americans and to blame Iran. This, this has got very little press and it's a, it's a fascinating uh, little piece of history that we should be looking at with greater scrutiny. Well, that's what we'll have more of if we allow the truth about 9-11 to be swept under the rug of history. More false flag attacks which Ken will uh, describe what's happening coming up here relative to that phenomena that is ubiquitous throughout his the history of wars. More wars around the world, millions more killed, more economic manipulation, worsening financial crisis, more loss of civil liberties, and we become, of course, a whole lot less safe. Whereas the truth about 9-11 illuminates these lies and results in the rectification of each of these disasters. So we see 9-11 in a whole new light as a means of exposing massive corruption to its heights, more importantly, as a way of recovering from its ills. So, uh, would you wait for the next 9-11, <laughs> predicted by members of Congress and, and the media to be far worse than the last? No, it's time to speak out now for a time comes when silence is betrayal. Thank you so very much for your kind attention for this first part of our two-part symposium.